Preventive medicine physicians receive formal training in biostatistics, epidemiology, health systems, population health, and the science of chronic disease prevention, infectious disease mitigation, and emergency preparedness and planning. Hospitals, health systems, and large employer groups such as yours are gaining new knowledge and understanding of the skills, expertise, and the overall acumen of the preventive medicine specialty. It is my hope more doors will open to enable residents to rotate through your offices and health systems to enhance the training and preparation of the next generation of these physician leaders so that they are best prepared to help your organizations address the real world challenges. In addition, our board certified physicians can add value to employed members of your team and support innovative strategies to improve the health of your employees and your patients with the goal to building health resilience in our communities locally, nationally, and yes, even globally. Also, I, I happen to serve as the Chief Strategy Officer and General Manager of Medical Solutions for the Health Transformation Alliance, a, a, uh, a co-op owned by about 60 of some of the country's largest and, and most progressive employers uh, that uh, represents about 5 million lives. And we work to help those companies reduce the cost, improve the outcomes of American healthcare for their for their employees. And today, thrilled to be able to bring along a uh, a, a person whose role and experience is is something that I <laughs> that I wish I had more opportunities to uh, to uh, encounter. Uh, we're going to be joined today by John Tarinas, uh, the chairman of Serograph and author of the company that solved healthcare, and uh, delighted to be able to bring you on. Uh, John, please tell us a little bit about yourself and and uh, excited to hear your story and some of the uh, some of the learnings that that you've gained along this journey. Uh, what we're here today is to discuss um, the ways to mitigate that hyperinflation. Uh, it's been averaging, I, I've been tracking this for, I started in 2003. We were about a, on a par with the, the national average back then. We were spending about 8,000 bucks per employee. Uh, the national average back then was 9,000. Flash forward 20 years, I'm now spending 11,500. And the national average per Kaiser uh, Foundation is 22,500. So, um, so I'm national average 22, I'm at 11. If I were at 22, it would be costing my company another 4 million bucks a year. And uh, we don't have the money. We probably wouldn't be here. A uh, little bit about Serograph to, to prime the pump. It's a combination of printing and manufacturing company. So you get in your car, we make the face of your instrument cluster. If you buy a Whirlpool clothes washer, we make the control panel. If you buy a ping golf club, the graphics are ours. So we, we make graphic components. We got about 500 people in West Bend, Wisconsin, four plants. Um, we were global, we had plants all over the world, but the world is uh, consolidated into regions. And so we're mainly a North American company now. So we, uh, we CEOs, we executives, I was CEO for 20 years. My son is now the CEO and I'm the chairman. Um, we always say, and you know, sort of the cant is, uh, our people are our most important asset. And we say that fairly glibly. Jack Welch said it, and he's the guy that fired 140,000 people at, at GE. Um, and as we all know, I just finished his biography. He was dead wrong. Uh, he fired 140,000 people. Um, he is, his mantra was, his be all end all mantra was shareholder value and shareholder price. Um, he, had, by the time he left after 20 years, GE was a shadow of, of its former wonderful self. So um, excuse the editorial, it's in my DNA. Uh, <laughs> so if we really do view our people as a treasure, and we do, I was in the Marine Corps, it was a brotherhood. We highly, highly valued each Marine. We depended on each other, life and death. Um, so, you know, our people really are our most valuable asset. So, but you can't just talk the talk you got to walk the talk and ceos that walk the talk take their the, the, the well-being of their employees very seriously and of course you can start with things like career planning and education reimbursement but also most importantly the health of their families so um 
And that, and I, and I always say this to CEOs, you know, we have the obligation to, to fix this economic mess. So the golden rule, uh, he who has the gold rules, we, the private company CEOs, and, or, and well, I should say company CEOs, we are the payers. At the end of the day, we pay for all of healthcare in America. We pay for the healthcare of our own employees. Um, they, of course, contribute, but we pay their wages so they can contribute. And then we pay all the taxes that supports the, the public sector for healthcare. It's about half of the public health in the United States. And that's Medicare, Medicaid, armed services. But we pay the whole bill. So if anybody's going to fix this and anybody should have a motivation to fix it, it should be the CEOs. Uh, we're, we're hired to solve complex problems. And so the people with a good background in problem solving and in business models and business problem solving ought to be able to get after this. And I'm here to tell you that uh, it, can, it can be solved. So at Serograph, so I, I told you the national inflation average over the last 20 years is, is eight plus percent. At Serograph, it's about 2.2. So that is an enormous difference. One, uh, one thought that sort of comes top of mind is uh, sort of the, the, I don't know if it was a Drucker adage or not, but what gets measured gets managed. And I think you know, you and I have even discussed this before that that we sort of swim in a in a sea of irrelevant information that's delivered up a lot of times by brokers or carriers or PBMs. And as somebody, especially as a CEO, you're having to track performance across so many areas of your business. Mm -hmm. What are the key KPIs that CEOs ought to be tracking in healthcare? Well, I I get a monthly report on every every line item in our in our health costs. Obviously, I don't get real granular, but say, so I know what our stop loss costs in a given month. Uh, I know what our drug cost is in a given month. So it's, it's sort of sort of big picture, but it but it tells me what's what's tracking and what's not tracking. So you're right. You get what you measure is what you get. And uh, yeah, so you got to have the metrics. Um, and we, uh, you know, I I know exactly. You know, I talked. To, let me go sideways. I talked to a lot of CEOs as I was one, <clears throat> and I'm a friendly guy. Um, and I'd, they'd say, geez, uh, my health costs are going, going crazy. Yeah. And I say, well, how much are they? How much are you paying per employee? And they go, well, I, I don't really know, but, uh, but I know they're out of control. And I go, well, oh. don't you think you better start managing like you manage every other side of your business? Yeah. And, and a lot of companies, by the way, have over the last 20 years have gotten aggressive and creative about their health costs. And they're mostly self-insured. So they're underwriting the risk. You got a risk, you better manage it, right? 100%. You're keeping people out of the hospital. And everybody with a half a brain in their head knows hospitals are very dangerous places. They're very expensive places. I lost a brother uh, to sepsis at a big yeah. hospital in Madison. So you, want them, you don't want them in hospitals. And if you got smart employees, they don't want to be there. Um, you got lower charges on your deduct deductibles and coinsurance. In our case, there's all kinds of free stuff. We actually took it too far. Free surgeries, I mean, no deductibles. We have free primary care, obviously, in our clinics, free physicals. Uh, if you'll use generic drugs, they're free. If you'll use hospice instead of a hospital, no one wants to die in a hospital or be sick in a hospital. Um, so our hospice is free. Um, if you got better health, you're going to have fewer loss, fewer lost paydays and better morale. Um, I saw a number once that a that a healthy couple in retirement versus an unhealthy saves about 250,000 bucks. So it's just, you've got job stability. If you're helping your company be competitive, the company is more uh, stable and your job is more stable. So it's a win, 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 win to about the ninth power for the employees if you get this stuff right. When, when, I, we, when we started doing things like you know, on-site clinics, we didn't know if they were really going to save costs. But we know now. We've been doing you know, We, a lot of employees, have been doing yeah. this for 20 years. And, and I got the numbers. I'm, up, I'm inflating at 2%. I talked to a guy the other day that was at 1% within a, with an on-site clinic and aggressive plan versus eight across the board. So mm. you, you, when we did some of this stuff early on, it was taking a leap of faith. You know, if, if we do the right thing, it's probably going to pay off on the economic side, but you don't have to guess anymore. It does pay off. On-site clinics pay off, self-insurance pays off, uh, direct contracts pay off. All this stuff works, and we're 
my company is just one living example of it. And there's many, many more now. You're going to hear from Breakbush Chicken uh, later in this conference. I, I've been over there. I, I do a lot of benchmarking. I go over and check out the, the, you know, the leading innovators. And you're going to hear the similar story from them. So. What are you, what are the main things that CEOs who are successful here are doing that others are not? When you talk to peers who are oblivious, like, is it just, is it paying attention to data? Is it taking action, experimenting? What are, what are some of the key attributes that, that separate those from those who are winning? Right. You know, and you know, so theoretically, this is with your second or third biggest spend, this ought to be a matter that goes as high as the board of directors. And so certainly the C-suite has to get involved in these issues because you, you know, it, it's sort of a yin and a yang with it, with healthcare. You got to manage it from the top, but you can't, you know, I can't manage everything from the top. It's got to be a yin and a yang. So I tell my people, Hey, you got to help me manage this. We're mm -hmm. co we got to co-manage this. You manage from the bottom up with the lives of your family and you'd be smart consumers, both in terms of, of, um, of how much of it you use and at what prices you use it. And you, so you manage on the, from the bottom up and we'll manage from the top down and bring it all together in a nice package. So, so those CEOs ought to be talking to other CEOs who are doing this stuff. I was on a board of one company that has, uh, for, for example, their premiums to their employees are set A, B, C, D. So the A health people have a lower or way lower premium than the D people who smoke and drink too much and are overweight. And so they pay a higher premium. So that's, I don't think that's been implemented in too many companies, but that's an example of, you know, benchmarking and talking to other CEOs. And then you, we took it into consideration. We do have a premium for our smokers here. So we've gone that far, um, but we haven't gone to the ABCD model. So you just got to get out and about. And that's what CEOs do. They get out and about and find out what's, they got to know what's going on inside their own company, but you also got to know what's going on in the external world.